quite hear, but I will nevertheless begin. Uh, just for fun, uh, I'll wake up a fun calculation, a useful, a useful simple calculation. Not really a calculation, a simple check. Should be the simplest scalar form. I mean, it should be one variable, uh, everything constant, and so on. So let's check it. Uh, if you, uh, uh, I think uh, there are two points. This is omega. So I think it's completely clear that uh, omega is a symplectic form, so omega is uh, non-degenerate. That's that you can just see immediately. And I wrote it in complex coordinates because uh, I wanted to use this representation of it. But if you compute this i over two, I use this. Uh, uh, it's there because I want it to be real. We want omega to be a real form. And um, you can see that omega bar is equal to minus i over 2 dz bar uh, where it's dz, I just write bar of it here. And of course then uh, this is alternating, so this is equal to omega. So that's the proof, if you like, that omega is real. I just take its bar and it's equal to this. Another proof is actually omega, if you compute it out the way I scaled this thing, uh, this is uh, exactly dx where she's bar. Here, where dz is always equal to dx. So these, we're, we're just waking up now with this calculation. So it's, it's really this simple two form. And now I'm going to check if I made a sign mistake. So let's check. <laughs> remember, remember the, what I, the way I like to write this thing is symplectic, in this case Kähler, Riemannian, and this should be a Venetian form. So let's just see if I made a mistake or not. I'm always worried about a sign mistake. Right? And remember what G, G of DW the way I wrote it, and there's the danger here that I made a, a sign mistake. So let's just say um, that was my definition. Um, so let's just see here, G, well, let's practice. Um, well, let's do on this side. So J of DDX, as you know, is DDY. So, omega uh, of, of 
for example, uh, uh, j, j, j of d dx is d uh, dy, and that is equal to j a g of d x d dy. So we want to know what that is, and that is equal to omega of d dy d dy. This is wonderful. And omega of d dy d dy is zero. So that's that's good. That means that this thing, these two things are perpendicular. This is d dx and d dy are perpendicular as frames with respect to this metric. And now we've come to check if I got the right sign. So let's just see omega of j of d dy. I think I got it. Uh, d dy. Right, that's going to be, this is going to be g of d dy d dy. And I would love it if that is 1. And this is omega of d dx d dy. Right? And omega is dx by dy. So d dx d dy. And that's 1. So it, it, it should be, this is a simple minded basis, should be orthogonal, or in, in fact, it's orthonormal, right? This is an orthonormal frame. So this is in, indeed, indeed as I wish, uh, G is positive definite. It's in fact <coughs> the standard in this space is the absolute standard body form, right? Uh, isn't, isn't yeah. of DD minus DD? Then, yeah. So you agree to this point. Where, where, are, where are you having troubles? I'm not sure that needs to be a close, that the of DDO has to be minus the DDO. So try to face this way. So here. Should be a minus? Let's go. So this is okay. This is a definition. Yes. And so, uh, oh, oh, it is a minus sign, right? Uh, because, uh, thank you, there's a minus sign here that because of course, here's here's d d y. Thank you, uh, d p. So this is j, and that's minus d d x. Very good that you you watched that calculation. So this is minus, and this is minus one. So I in fact was wrong. It's I, the the metric I wrote down is negative definition, right? Um, so I get to change the definition, but that's okay. What? Yes. Uh, so. <coughs> So, so long as we use symplectic, we're going to have, so all the metrics that are generated this way, so all these scalar metrics, yes. would necessarily have to be uh, such that um, um, stuff, so such that um, dx um, and dy are orthogonal. Uh, no. No. Well, it, it, no. For the, for, well, for this, for this, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. In, in dimension two, yes. In one complex dimension. But shouldn't we be able to have uh, Riemannian metrics that are where um, where DDX That's and right. DY are not? Um, That's right. We're not getting here arbitrary uh, Riemannian metrics. That's your point. Yes. Yeah, I agree completely. So we have the space of all Riemannian metrics. We have this symplectic thing. Given the symplectic thing and the complex structure, we get special Riemannian metrics. By the way, that's the goal of my lecture here in some sense, is to find uh, good metrics that have some meaning in geometry. I mean, the space of metrics is too big. Right? So we want to find a smaller space. I thought I made a minus sign mistake. So this is minus one. So now I'm going to change the definition to make, make this. So I'm going to do that. G of B W is equal to omega of B J W. Okay. Okay. 
So it's positive definite. And we can see, yeah, okay. And now you another another wake up, another another wake up definite calculation. Uh, you should always just try something stupid. This form here, if you write it down, so is 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 identically zero. So this is of no interest whatsoever. Right? So in, in a two-dimensional case, the only come only forms in the two-dimensional case. In a, a two-dimensional case. A little bit of what you're saying uh, are some are some function times dz dz bar, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you like, some function times dx dy wedge dy, right? and, uh, of this form. <clears throat> so this form in complex geometry is called a one-one form. And the one, the first one means that one, and the second one means that one. Okay, so in general, uh, in general, we have a PQ form. So this a form of this type will, will look like sum uh, uh, omega i omega j dz i right, dz j bar where i and j is, are multi indices so i and j are multi indices the length of i is p and the length of j is q. If you're not Accustomed to these multi indices, by this I mean dz i1 where dz uh, i p, and by this I mean dz uh, i, let's say j1 which bar dz. That's just what we call a PQ form, and so in general, we in general we're interested in two forms. So every two form, two form omega equals say uh, omega <clears throat> two zero plus omega one one plus omega. Zero two. This is two zero form, a one one form, and a zero two form. That's all you get. Those are the only possibilities for dimension two. Yes. But if you have a omega two zero form, then that would be dz minus dz, which is zero, right? The omega. The two, it, say it again. So, uh, an omega two zero form. That's well, zero if you take the alternate. No, uh, dimension two. Of course, it has to be in the form dz wedge dz. Yes. So, so it's zero. Yeah. But in dimension three, it could be dz1 wedge dz7. Or whatever, no, well, in dimension three, it could be dz1 dz3. So you can see a lot of things vanish automatically. And also, we're considering alternating forms, right? Well, you know how I am with you. With uh, we're considering only alternating forms, right? Yes, everything I say here is alternating forms. Because form. otherwise, it wouldn't be. That's right. Everything's alternating form. So, right, and we're interested in what's going to, what's going to be possible here. For example, this is what Maria is saying. This, this, for example, this form in dimension three would be is not zero, right? That form is not zero in dimension three. Right. However. This form uh, is not 
does not satisfy this two, let me emphasize what I'm talking about, this two zero form does not satisfy J being an isometry. Because J acts on DZ1, J, DZ1 is an eigenvector for J, it's the eigenvector of plus I. And D, DZ3 in this case is the, also an eigenvector of plus I, you can just compute it out, you understand what I'm saying? You have J, the J action by this action, that's a, that's a, hmm? That's a linear action, yes. It's a, it's a, it's a, if you're like a matrix, but I mean, it, 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 yes. And you see what what happens to omega, and we're requiring that omega is invariant. That this J axis is isometry, but, but J when you apply to DZ one is I times DZ one, and J when you apply to DZ three is I times DZ three, and I times I is minus one. So these things are in the minus one eigenspaces. And all you have left over is one one forms. And one form, one one forms are cool because you have a DZ term and a DZ bar term, and the, and the, the eigenvector of the DZ is the eigenvalue of the DC is I, and the eigenvalue of the DC bar is minus I, and I times minus I is one. Okay? So this condition, so this condition that I, J works beautifully with respect to omega is equivalent to omega is a 1-1 one, one form. Okay? The 1-1 one, one form. <clears throat> so you can re redefine Kaler and, uh, form or metric because it's the same thing. It's omega, which satisfies several conditions. It's symplectic, it's non degenerate, and the non degeneracy, uh, uh, well, it's, it's omega is a 1 1 form, it's <coughs> closed. And the associated metric is positive and definite. So this is <clears throat> this was his remark here. There are many metrics that aren't of this form. Probably so not obviously, right? But we're looking for a good class of metrics that appears in nature. And this is Kaler's point. This, this class of metrics appears very, very naturally. Okay? So, natural class of metrics. Kodaro uh, lemma is omega Taylor with an omega. Uh, omega is just, so you have to scale it to make it real, d bar of a function. And this function is a special function which arises when you require that the metric is positive definite, this function is strictly personal, we say strictly personal harmonic. Bar 
of a function rho with i over 2. This is just a scaling factor to make, make it come out nicely and real, of course. D of d bar. Now, what's d bar of something? It's partial rho with respect to z uh, bar. I, I, my indices are now downstairs for some reason. dz bar. Uh, and this is equal i over 2 uh, second partial derivative of rho e z beta. Well, let's put a beta here so we get alpha beta. So beta, so alpha uh, dz beta bar dz alpha wedge dz beta bar. Okay. okay. I just did the calculation. I, this is a warm up to, to get some feeling for these numbers. Physicists should like this. PDE people should like this. Anybody who does any analysis should like this. Okay. And this guy here is a matrix. And you can see it's very closely related to a Hessian, right? You use this very closely related to a Hessian. And the curvature that comes from this metric is very important. We call this the complex Hessian. Okay, and this form has to inform this, this met this met this Hessian uh, let's call it Hessian uh, of Rho uh, complex Hessian of Rho this Hessian of Rho is positive definite means G is the Kahle metric. And our language is uh, the same thing as omega is the Kahle form. So all of you people who like to feel the calculation, it's very useful. That's that's what's going on here. You see this is this is very, very closely related to something like a Laplacian. Yes, in many areas. No, no issue. It rises, change signs. Yeah. So, uh, but they're, they're, uh, well, for our purposes here, I just change signs. But it means you're changing around all definitions. So, for example, these things satisfy the maximum principle, and then probably if you have to change sides, it would satisfy the minimum. You know, things like that. So we like to have have some consistency. In this. Okay, so the main example, the main first example, so again, my lectures today will be producing good metrics that are interesting and occur in nature. Again, the space of all metrics is huge and contains a bunch of stuff that nobody understands. It's too big. It's too big. So you want to find uh, metrics of interest, and I'm now going to convince you that these metrics occur anywhere, everywhere. <clears throat> and so the full, first goal is, for, for an example, is I would like to show that n-dimensional projective space Possesses a, a natural Taylor structure. <clears throat> so 
to line this up for you. This is called omega. In this case, we write omega fs because this metric was written down, I guess, for the first time. This is called the Fubini. We write here metric. Even though it's the form, we just write the metric. what I talked about toward the end of the last lecture, right? Very slowly, uh, with some ideas. Talking about ideas, ideas, very good. So what we're going to use is we have Cn plus 1. I'm going to do it in a bit of generality. Uh, we're going to use this vibration that defines projective space. You know, you know this vibration we talked about it before. Right? And when I write this picture here, I put the fiber like this. I always write it like that. That's a picture of what I have in mind for this fiber bundle. This is upstairs. Uh, I, I call this upstairs. I call this the fiber because every fiber is C star. And I call this downstairs. When you hear mathematicians talk, you hear mathematicians always talk like this. We got some stuff upstairs, we want to push it down to downstairs. This is a standard thing, and this is the way we think, going up and down. Okay? Okay. Now, I'll get to this in a second, but I want to discuss the discussion we had particularly with Maria last time in a general situation. This is a bundle. This is a principal bundle. I want to say what is a principal bundle and a few remarks about it. I mean, you asked me about principal bundles before. You asked me about carton connections before. That's, this is how carton was thinking. Okay. So this is an example of a principal bundle, but let's just talk a little bit about principal bundles so you know the words at least.
Now, I think everybody here who was in, uh, in the previous semester of uh, on manifolds, and you discuss a bit what is a Lie group, but, but uh, let's uh, recall what a Lie group is. Uh, a Lie group is a group. <laughs> it's a group. It's a group. Everybody knows what a group is. With smooth structure. This is what you keep in your head. And then you have to say what it means the structure is smooth. Well, it means multiplication, which is the mapping G times G goes to G. Always write operations as, multi as, as mappings. Yeah? This mapping, well, it depends how you write it. Maybe you write it like this, uh, maybe not. Uh, is a smooth map. There is some choice here, maybe you put inverse here, but I separate that into two things. The other mapping, uh, uh, the inverse mapping is also smooth. Good. Yeah. Do you pack No, you're just, you're okay. How are you feeling today? Any better? No. I mean, good weather helps. Okay, and keep in mind, uh, keep in mind matrix groups. And I'm going to write down uh, a few matrix groups for you that you probably have heard of before, but uh, are useful. Uh, one I like very much is a unitary group. So, for example, anything with S, uh, I'm going to write down SU2. So when you have the number 2, that means 2 by 2 matrices. And when you have S, that means determinant of equal to 1. Quite often we scale the determinant to 1, and, and it's, that's what it do. And th this... Uh, well, these are the matrices. Uh, well, maybe I'm going to write the matrices as B. Uh, in 2x2 uh, in two two matrices, so the endomorphisms of C2, linear endomorphisms of C2, which preserve uh, the Hermitian structure, where H of B, 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 W, equals H of BW for H, the standard Hermitian structure. You have the same group for any positive definite Hermitian structure. And what does it mean positive definite? Positive definite Hermitian structure, people get confused by it, including me sometimes, what the words mean. Um, uh, yes? Yeah. Well, it's not the same as the Every Hermitian form is canonically decomposable in a symmetric form, minus i, or plus, if it depends on your, your taste, an alternating form. The real part of a Hermitian form is Riemannian. The real part is symmetric. No, the imaginary part is alternating. These are canonically associated things to a Hermitian thing. So if you have a Hermitian thing, you look at G. And now you know G is symmetric. G, G has eigenvalues. And so positive definite means, positive definite H means positive de definite G. Okay? But to have H is much better than to just have G. So, for example, a matrix in this thing, I hope you know how to, to write matrices immediately in this thing. It means you write them in a, in a, you write down a, a unitary basis of column vectors. Right? So you write down A, B, that's a column vector. And you write down minus B bar A, you have no choice here because this is supposed to be perpendicular. And this is perpendicular the way I've written it. And you want these things to have length 1. 
Yeah. So norm of this. So this is this is norm of this thing has to be one. So the norm of that thing is this. Is yes. Uh, the norm of this thing is this. This is really interesting. The norm of this thing is the determinant of this matrix. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? The norm of the norm, the norm of this vector here is supposed to be one because it's, you're supposed to. Uh, well, you're interested in orthonormal basis, and that is exactly the the, the the scaling factor that makes this special unitary. So you see that the special unitary group, and in general, the unitary groups are very important. The special unitary group of on two by two matrices is as a manifold S three. Right? It's a manifold S3 sitting in C2. It's just. Right. <clears throat> now, a little historical comment. You will laugh and say this is trivial because it's just two by two matrices. Let's forget the condition that the matrix is in, is, has determinant 1. Let's just write the matrix down with no condition whatsoever. Okay? So you have C2 equals the set of matrix. No condition now. This, I'll just write it down. It's A, B, minus B bar, A bar. You agree. There's no condition. just A, B. That's C2. For example, the zero matrix is there. <laughs> okay. Well, it's interesting that this thing comes equipped with addition right, and multiplication. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It comes equipped with addition, multiplication, and a norm, which is the determinant. Addition, multiplication, and a norm, which is the determinant. Suppose you were this guy who supposed was very involved with physics. Suppose you were a guy sitting in Ireland someplace saying, I am looking for the quaternions. Yes? All you need to know is you should be thinking about two by two matrices which, which have this form. So these are the quaternions. Okay? These are the quaternions. So this is the quaternions. And you see the very close relationship to the quaternions and the unitary group. The unit quaternions, the unit quaternions are determined at one, and that is, a, that is a group. OK. So that's a nice lead group. Uh, and, and as you all know, I, my, one of my favorite groups is G equal SU. I'm always liking things that are unit like somehow unitary. SU um, <coughs> one one is one of my favorite groups. SU one one. Well, same definition. Same definition. Uh, this is a set of B such that H uh, composed with B equals H. And now I'm going to write here H11. So a Hermitian form of signature 11. Okay. H11, uh, the norm, the associated norm, norm 11 of Z, one one norm is Z1 squared minus Z2 squared. Yeah. Right? Now you all, of course, know that you should never write anything like that. It says the Hermitian thing of Z and W. I don't know how you like to write it, but I would probably write it like this. It's a question of how you want to write it, but I would write it probably like this, where E11 is the diagonal matrix 1 minus 1. 
Right. I would recommend writing it like that. That's the way you write a form. Form, this is the matrix of the form. Hermitian forms you write with a bar, usually in mathematics with a bar in the front, and physics with a bar in the back. This is a mathematics lecture, so I put the bar in the front. So this is this is this is the Hermitian form of signature one one. You see the eigenvalues here, one minus one. Okay. Well, you can do the same thing that we did before. If you want, you can write down just an orthonormal basis, and that's the general matrix, right? I hope you're good at that. You write down an orthonormal basis, and that's the general matrix in, in, in this thing. Let's, let's even try it. A, B. <laughs> now let's see, it's got to be orthonormal with respect to this guy. So I don't know, let's just try, I don't know, let's try here something like, I don't know, uh, maybe, uh, maybe that. Does that look orthonormal with respect to that? As the same as before. Hmm? As the same as before. Is that the same as before? Oh, that's the same as before. So maybe we better change the sign somehow. Uh, right? So uh, what should we change the sign here? Uh, we, we, what we're doing here, we're multiplying. We want this to be, so that times that, minus that. Well, let's put CD here. You see, you have to learn to guess in mathematics, although I can do this systematically, but it's better to guess, right? So we want to make this orthonormal, so that times that minus that times that, right? With bar everywhere. So that times that bar, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, how are we doing? Does that look better? Hmm? That looks better, doesn't it? That's it, right? That, that times that bar is AB, that times that bar is minus, is minus AB, right? Oh, that times that bar is minus AB, and that times that bar is AB, so it's zero. Okay, there it is. Okay, with determinant equal to one, so determinant equals one is, uh, Oh, I see what I'm doing here. Uh, what I don't like, what I, what I screwed this up, is, is the determinant of this thing looks negative, right? Uh, right? This is, uh, oh, yes. So let's change it around. Oh, that times, that bar is A minus B. Oh, we can go, that's not right. We have to leave it like that, huh? No. No, we need to do, we know we need no minus signs. What do you think? Yeah. That times that bar is AB, that times that bar is uh, A B. Why not put the minus sign on the other side? Huh? Why not put the minus sign on at A or B? Where do you want to put a minus sign? You say A minus B, B bar, A bar. A minus, you want to put A, are you going here, one? Okay, good. And uh, this is, is that good? You like that? Is it perpendicular with respect to this Hermitian structure? Huh? This vector, oh, I like what you, uh, Maria's suggestion, because that makes the determinant norm. Right? So let's see here. A times this bar would be AB. A times this bar would be minus AB. Is that good or bad? I'm trying to get you. Come on, you physics guy. You're supposed to be able to compute. C, 
D times 1 minus 1 AB equals uh, <laughs> You're supposed to be able to compute. You guys are computing or not? So SU2, so SUN, which you can write as SUN0, is compact. And SUPQ, or P and Q both positive, is not compact.
These groups are examples of simple Lie groups. What does the word simple mean? Okay. So in general, a group G, uh, a, a, a group, a, a group is said to be simple whenever The only normal, it's only it's only normal subgroups are G and the trivial group. down because this is not the definition of a simple Lie group. Let me just comment on, on group theory in general. If you have any group and a normal subgroup, and the symbol for a normal subgroup is that, that means normal subgroup, right? Then what you can do is you have an upstairs and you have a downstairs and upstairs is a group and downstairs is a group and the fiber is a group and you analyze the group by the fiber of going from upstairs to downstairs. Right. Good. So the building blocks of group theory are simple groups. That means you can't do any of this stuff. You start to analyze it and you, have, you don't know what to do because you have nothing to go up and down and so on. Building blocks are simple group. Now, one of the biggest projects in all of mathematics, which was finished just a few years ago, was the full classification of finite simple groups. Okay. So finite simple groups are classified. <clears throat> I have actually used the classification in, in some of my geometric research. So it's a very useful classification. It's a question of what classification means in the various classes. And to roughly tell you what it means, I think this work is 5,000 pages. I'm not sure. It's one of the greatest joint ventures, if you will like, in mathematics, led by a great mathematician who has passed away, but <clears throat> I've read the articles about this classification uh, written by Ashbacher, so there, 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 are, there are some expository articles that you can read about it, which you can probably find on the web, which explain this classification. It's very useful. <clears throat> one of the key building blocks, so one of the key points is that certain people had conjectured a classification and conjectured the existence in this classification of a certain group. But the, we didn't know if the group exists or not. You know, that's usually the problem. You have a big list, but I don't know if that guy exists. Right? 
This group was found and is called the monster group. It is found in some sense by physics. It is very closely related to something we call leech lattice. So these things always end up being symmetries of something of combinatorial, a combinatorial type. For example, lattice. I want to make a comment about a person who you should read. He is not fundamental in this thing, but he's always been my friend in, on any questions I've ever had about anything like this. I asked this wonderful mathematician who understands very well geometry as well as the group theory, Jacques Keith. Tits, you must imagine how Tits is very old by now. I think he's still living. Had very bad Parkinson's the last time. Do you know the disease Parkinson's when you, when you, you know, Parkinson's disease? It makes you shake. So Jacques Tits, you must imagine this person essentially older than I am now, gray and not in very good shape, but in his brain, perfect shape, explaining in a lecture how we should think about the monster, monster group, going to the blackboard, and saying the order of the monster group is this. And he started writing down triple. He had them in triples, like 238, and then he'd write another triple. The order is some unbelievable order, which he knew by memory. And it's so beautiful seeing this guy in love with this beautiful group. It's just a beautiful thing. It's huh? This beautiful group is monster. Monster, that's right. Yes, it's a certain symmetry group or something, so it's very nice. And anything you can read by Jacques Tietz, I re recommend it. He writes absolutely beautifully. A simple Lie group and Jacques Tietz, of course, made many contributions also to that subject, is not necessarily simple. Okay? is the only normal subgroups are in fact finite and in fact central. So the only thing of interest, only thing to worry about, is the center of the group, which is finite, a finite subgroup. You understand, the center of the group is the group set of elements that commutes with every element. Again, we use the German notation for some reason. Center. At least I do. I don't know. Okay. So the center of GL uh, two uh, is the diagonal matrices lambda one, lambda two for lambda i. Uh, lambda i, or no, not lambda 1, lambda, lambda in GL2, let's say GL2 uh, r, lambda in r, not 0. <clears throat> you see it's not connected, and that's the fact that GL2 itself is not connected. Uh, let's look at the center of SL2R, just for fun. This is exactly this group. No identity. It's just the finite of the C2. And that is quite typical, that you will have these little finite centers playing a role. So let's see, what's going on here? We 
finally got this right here. You see, in this guy, you see this guy here? Minus the identity is in this guy, right? I think we write it with A equal minus 1, right? That commutes with everything. So that's the center of this group. So these, the center here uh, is equal to Z2, uh, and the center of, of, of SU2 is also equal to Z2. Now, that's the group. Oh, I wanted to say, some, where did I write the word compact and non compact? Do you see it someplace? Ah! This is the idea behind here is positive curvature. Whatever that means, this afternoon I will begin discussing that. And whatever that, whatever happens here is negative curvature. Whatever that means. So I would like to introduce uh, the notion of principal bundle, and then we'll stop this morning, okay? This was just a short review of, of uh, <clears throat> the group. Let me just make a statement about the groups and why, a qualitative, a qualitative statement. Why that? A very rough statement. surfaces in three dimensions, then M has a piecewise linear structure. The professional people in the subject call this PL structure, piecewise linear. That means for us, a surface can be triangulated. It has a perfect triangulation. You understand what I mean by perfect triangulation? The triangles fit well together, and you have the same type of simplicial, perfect simplicial decomposition of a three manifold. Okay. That implies, by the way, this is a dimension two was proved in the 1920s. And in dimension three was proved in the 1950s. So this is not this is not Euler Lagrange. This is much more recent. Okay. This implies that M has a smooth structure. That 
That means that in dimension two and dimension three, all of life is in differential geometry. Because any smooth manifold has a huge number of metrics, and we want to use these metrics. Yeah? And we will see, here's the rough remark, we'll see that, that the, class, the classification then in dimension one, in, in, in dimension two and three is legal. Uh, oh yeah. Let me just say what that means. <coughs> let, let me see what say what that means, and I will explain more in this the course of this lecture. But in dimension two, then the universal cover M tilde is hyperbolic space with the group SU11 acting. You can say in the language, modern language of Thurston, the geometrization in dimension two is almost trivial. There's only one manifold, and the geom geometrization is the, is the is the group SU. In Thurston's theory, in dimension two, in dimension three. So you know, you've heard. Everybody at Yakutsk University jumps on famous things. Hey, man, it's cool. It's famous, growth and deep, there's things so on. You don't understand a word, but I'm going to say at least some words. Thurston introduced eight classes of manifolds in dimension three. He's trying to classify topological manifolds in dimension three. He knows they, they have a unique smooth structure. He's really happy. Yes. And he introduces what he calls eight a, cl a classification of eight geometrizations. These geometrizations are all Lie group oriented manifolds. Everything behind them is Lie group. Okay? So there are eight classes. They are all homogeneous. They are, they, they, and the big class, guess what? The big class, the big class of, of, of his theory. Is M tilde equal hyperbolic space. Okay. And the group then is uh, hyperbolic space was here, so it has to be three dimensional group, uh, stuff. So this was two dimensional, is SU1 um, 2. This group uh, here is SU11. If you like, you can think of this group here as SL2R. But I never think of this as okay. So what's behind the basic manifolds in life are the groups. Okay. And their actions. 
So we we'll find a what is the principal bundle? A principal G bundle. Keep in mind the thing to keep in mind, and then I'll make it precise, and then we will go. Is a manifold M equipped? Well, a manifold I'll call it P for principal bundle equipped. With a free, proper G action, and I'm going to say a right G action. <clears throat> Period. That's it. And what is P? Hmm? What is P? So, P is the bundle space, okay? So, this is a manifold, first of all, <laughs> okay? First of all, it's a manifold, so it's a reasonable question. And this will be in the bundle space. So here's the picture we had before, Cn plus 1 minus 0, upstairs, fiber by C star action, fiber by action. And projected space downstairs. The a general principle bundle is upstairs. Equipped with a G action, which is free. So that means there's no there's no fixed points. That means if I, the G action is identified with the orbit, because it's free. And to a manifold downstairs, let us say the manifold the base, base manifold. So, in that sense, M is equal to P modulo the action. Okay, modulo the action. It's the orbit space of the, of the action. And in the literature, the action is always a right action. You know, if you have a proper action, the quotient is Hausdorff, it's a, a, a free proper action. You've talked, we've talked about this in many places. You have a free proper action. Uh, the quotient is a manifold, and it has all the properties you want. So if you have a free proper action upstairs, you have the quotient, which is a manifold. The fiber is the group, because it's free. So it's the same picture that I always draw. These are the orbits. And this is downstairs. This is P. And M is the orbit space of that. Now, the warning is in the literature, and there's a good reason for this that I avoided for many years in my life, but you should not avoid it. It is a right action. What does it mean, right action? So a left action means G of H uh, of, of X is equal to G of H of X. Right? That's what you think. First, yes. But this is a left action. A right action. 
mean, you can always turn it around, but it's better when you read to realize what people are doing. It means that G of, of H of X equals G uh, H of X. Have I done this right? Well, <laughs> to be parallel, to be parallel with this, I have to do this. So have I done this right? Let's, let's see. You, you know what I'm talking about, the difference between left and right. No? <laughs> yeah. First, you apply H. First, I'll do it on the other side. First you apply H, and then you apply G. This, this, if it's a left action, it's this. Okay? And if it's a right action. Okay? Yeah, I'm boring you. Okay. So you have, it's a question of which side you're really acting on this thing. Yeah. So, you understand? If, you, if, you, in a, if you're in a group, this map mapping, G goes to GH, this mapping is a right action. This is a right action. This mapping, G goes to HG, is a left action. Right? The associative law looks different for a right action and a left action, just the opposite. Okay. So in the literature, you will see everything here, a right action. So you have a quotient by a right action. Okay, okay fine. That's a principle of unlimited. It makes no difference whatsoever here, because that's an infinity group. I mean, you can't even see the difference. Okay, see you this afternoon. Sorry for being so long.